welcome back to the Relentless Podcast, where we are always trying to bring you practitioners and individuals that will help you on your physical, mental, and emotional journey. You'll see me use these little Play-Doh balls a lot because I think it's a good visual to remind us all that all of the parts that we are really form into one and we have to look at each individual part. Yes, but they all make up a whole. So for today's podcast, we're going to talk about some things that for a lot of people are embarrassing and they don't want to talk about it at all. And I'm so excited to have my guest with me today, Michelle. And your last name can be said either Benoit or Benoit, correct? It can be however you want. Yep. <laughs> so depending on where you're from, you can That's get right. hard tea or sound more fancy. That's so right. Thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. I really am just enjoying you know you inviting me on and i love to have this awkward conversation that most people don't like to have <laughs> so if you're wondering if you don't haven't read the notes of what this podcast is about i'm just going to put it out there we're going to talk about the muscles of the body that hold your pee and hold your poo that's right they're super important it's it's real simple but at the same time really difficult to get <laughs> practitioners yeah. and ourselves to address so the muscles that I'm talking about are at the, the bottom of our trunk and it's called the pelvic floor muscles. And what I do with massage and body work, um, people that I deal with every day over, over a decade of working with people, most of my clients have never heard of pelvic floor therapy. Yeah. So they understand muscles of the shoulder and the hip and the, every other body part and limb but they're just, unless they've had a baby and had some experience yeah. with that part of their body, they're not aware that those muscles are just the same as any other muscle. They're just yeah. in a part that we don't like to talk about. So, so first true. of all, tell everyone what your background is, your education, and kind of how you maneuvered through that education into this spe specific field. Yeah, so I am a physical therapist. Um, I've been a physical therapist now for 14 years. And I first entered um, physical therapy pr profession as um, with a master of physical therapy degree. And then I ended up getting my doctorate in physical therapy. So I treated outpatient kind of what you would think of as, you know, general physical therapy, that the knee pain, the back pain, the neck pain um, for six years when I first got out of school. And then I had my first baby. Mm. And like you said, I mean, I went through PT school. I went through getting a doctorate. You know, we're supposed to know about everything in the body from a muscular standpoint. And I would say if we had two lectures that talked about the pelvic floor muscles, that, you know, that's probably what we had at the time. Um, I know it's gotten better since, but um, when I was pregnant, my OB actually asked me if I treated pelvic floor. Um, I lived in upstate New York, and we didn't have any PTs up there who were really treating it. So he kind of got me interested, thinking, hmm, I don't know, I don't do it now, but, you know, maybe in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and then come to find out, I'm on maternity leave, and a good friend of mine says, hey, I'm taking this introduction pelvic floor course. Do you want to come? So I did, and ever since then, I, I have just absolutely loved treating everything pelvic floor. Um, I, I kind of built a pelvic floor practice up in New York at the private practice that I was working at at the time, and um, then when I came down here five years ago, I just kind of took that, I just ran with pelvic floor, and that's pretty much primarily what I do at this point. And are you in private practice here? You have your own yeah, practice? so I, I do have my own practice. Um, I treat concierge, which, so I'll come to you. And um, I also do treat clients two days a week for Novant Health. Wonderful. In Midtown, yeah. Excellent. So I think I like to connect the dots with some people because a lot of times people will ask me, I'm a massage therapist, why in the mm -hmm. world am I talking about pelvic floor? Yeah. And that's, I always go back to, this is why I talk mind body connection, because yes. the reason is I, I can see in a session with some people, how their body communicates mm -hmm. or the lack thereof in yeah. trying to get some range of motion in a leg yeah. or how they hold their body on the table, yeah. that something's up more than just a, a, a typical like you were saying, when you treat the regular shoulder yeah. joint, what, you know, knee, right. I can tell with someone how their body is or is not responding to my work, that there's something more there. 
And so over my decade of experience with people, Mm -hmm. what I see is when I start asking questions or when they start sharing information about their history, there is so often a connection of some type of trauma and trauma doesn't have to mean a bad thing. Right. It just means a thing, a A thing thing. outside the norm of that part of the body. So when I start helping people and trying to help them with their hip pain, and find out they had a very traumatic childbirth delivery and never recovered from that well, then develop body issues, body image issues, Mm -hmm. gain some extra weight, that area of the body becomes a huge contributing factor to why they're coming to see me. So that's how we tie in what I'm doing as a massage therapist that I need you to take them into that journey of discovering more about that part of their body. Um, so st- let's start off with just, so now that people know what we're talking about, yeah, let's start off with just some anatomy of that part of the body and you just take it and wherever you want to go with it, start yeah, educating so, us. So as, as a pelvic floor physical therapist, I really don't just look only at the, at the pelvic floor muscles, but really what we are treating as pelvic floor therapists is really the entire core of the body, right? And so the core is our middle canister that um, encompasses the respiratory diaphragm. So the muscle that is sitting kind of at the bottom of the rib cage or, you know, just underneath the lungs, um, all the muscles of the abdominal wall, which you know, the abdominal wall is several muscular layers Mm -hmm. and connective tissue, you know, layers. Um, And then we've got the pelvic floor slinging at the bottom. And then we've got all of the connective tissue and the extensor muscles that are coming up the back of our spine. So versus just having, just thinking of it as kind of the one group of muscles, we really look at the entire core together and how that functions. And you brought in a good point. With you, what, yeah, what you were saying. This is, this is why I like you so much because that's how every practitioner should be and why people aren't getting the care that they need is because we just only look at one part of the body. Mm-hmm. So I'm even more of a fan. <laughs> no, and what you were saying about the hips, right? So the hips are kind of, if we're going to think like, okay, ground, ground zero kind of thing is our core. Well, our hips are just like that one degree out, right? Mm-hmm. And when you're, when you're talking about hip pain or hip dysfunctions, we have to look inside the pelvic floor because that the pelvic floor is sitting on the inside of the hip joint. And then of course we've got all of those posterior, the the muscles behind like glute max and the muscles off to the side, those hip rotators and those guys all work. And then of course the inner thighs and they all work together. And you're right. Any, any injury, trauma, what name it, can create, can create um, tension holding patterns, right? And so, you know, we can get so easily to get some muscle imbalances in there. Um, I just wanted to, I'm just gonna screen share with you really quick. And, cause I've got some nice little pictures here. Let me see. Do, okay, I right. love pictures because yeah, the, more, the more we can, that this is one of the things I love to talk about people and bring to their attention is we disassociate. That is a coping mechanism, Mm. especially when there's been some trauma, we disassociate with our body um, and don't want to think about it. Don't want to look at it. Don't want to touch it. And that sends a lot of negative um, thought processes into our mind body connection. So So I love when we can, when you can show people the images they begin to reconnect with that part of their body. And yeah. I, te- I teach them how to do their own abdominal massage mm-hmm. and they actually touch that part of their body. Yeah. Again. So the yeah. more information, the more tactile they're getting, you start to learn your body better. So I love yes. the pictures. So yes. hit it. <laughs> yeah. So just exactly what we were just talking about, right? Is this, this is really as a pelvic floor therapist, this is where we're starting from because this is our starting spot. And, you know, we've got the dome at the top there being the diaphragm. We've got the abdominal wall down the middle, pelvic floor on the bottom, and then, of course, the multifidi. What we don't, the one thing we don't see in this picture is all of that connective tissue. You're mm-hmm. a body worker, right? So you know there, there is connective tissue all throughout these layers of muscle, and they, they connect one thing to the other. So, again, like you said, we can't, 
we can't take one part of the body and think that the other parts of the body aren't having an effect because they're mm -hmm. all connected together. Um, and then when we get into the pelvic floor, we, you know, it's, it's talked about like a pelvic floor, like, it, like it's one thing or like it's one muscle. And it's actually three separate layers of muscle that I like to explain it to my clients. It, it's kind of like a three layer cake where the layers stack up on top of each other from closest to the outside of your body to deeper within your body. So for example, this, this would be a woman lying on her back and we're kind of looking at her, right? We've got the tailbone on the bottom, the pubic bone up there on top. These are the muscles closest to the outside of the body. You can see where we've got the anal opening, the vaginal opening, and the urethra, and all of those muscles that circle around them, pelvic floor, right? So those circular muscles are in charge of either compressing and closing off those um, openings or relaxing and opening up the openings. Just behind there, we've got a second layer of muscle that, again, does a lot of work as far as um, compressing, closing off tubes, and then uh, opening up the tubes. And then these guys, these are the deepest layer of pelvic floor muscles. They're the kind of the furthest inside your pelvis. You can see they're kind of bigger, they take up more space. Um, so they do a lot of work with like supporting the colon and supporting the rectum, um, really just support in general. But what's also interesting, if you look over to the side here, kind of on the left-hand side, you can see the piriformis muscle, the obturator internus, those are hip rotators. But you can see how close they sit and they lie in with those pelvic floor muscles. So for example, your hip pain, right? That lateral, maybe that trochanteric bursitis. Well, what's kind of pulling that? Maybe it's being pulled from inside, from those pelvic floor muscles that kind of marry in with, um, with the hip rotators, for example. So. So I love, I love, I love that graphic. And so connecting this back to body work, if some of my clients are watching this, you know exactly what this looks like. So that picture is, is you face down. And one of the techniques that I use in a session, if a client is laying face down, I have their leg at 90 degrees mm -hmm. and I rotate it out towards me mm -hmm. to try to get some internal rotation. femoral rotation because yeah. everyone is, especially my guys that stand with those legs out, feet pointed that way, rolling back yeah. on my pelvis. Yes. And with, and that's, that right there is one of the techniques where I can start to begin to see something that's going on because some people they're at 90 degrees and they will not, that's it. they will not mm -hmm. come out. And so that's when I start to explore, yeah. is it just functional anatomical or right. are they squeezing and holding? So you can see those big muscles mm -hmm. around the pelvic floor. You're exactly right. Those could be out of tension and why sure. we'll talk about later, but it could be holding that hip into, and, and we'll get into this too, but I, I do hip, I do hip openers all the time. You're probably opening your hip the wrong way. Right. <laughs> You're right. opening it, you're opening it into where the compression is. And so yes. we'll talk about that more, but continue on with the anatomy. I love that picture though. It's a great, yeah, it's a, it's a great, some great pictures. So, um, so that's pelvic floor essentially. And I just had mentioned really quick, right. That again, we always, we always have to look at the abdominal wall and what all those people are doing ab work, right? Like, so what are we doing and what are you doing on a repetitive basis? right? Because it's so many layers. It's layers upon layers. And again, all of the connective tissue kind of joins, joins the muscles together. So, you know, if we're over tensioning, we have trigger points or muscle spasms in any, in any of these muscles throughout the system, the system isn't going to, isn't going to work as well as it could. So um, just an, I like, like that visual too, to, to kind of understand it's, it's complex and it's three dimensional. Mm -hmm. That's kind of just very general to give people an idea of yeah. where are we talking about? Yes. I think that's a you good know? visual for people and for them to understand it's 360, 360, mm -hmm. 360, 360. the bottom 360. Yeah. And I, I tell, the way I explain my clients and I'm helping them work with their diaphragm is just imagine a balloon mm -hmm. under your rib cage, top to bottom, That's right. all the way around front to back front to back, top to bottom, every way around is what we have to start looking at yeah. to find dysfunction. Yeah. So when we're talking about, so we're, we, we're, we've now 
hopefully brought this to some people's attention that this could be a contributing factor to pain. Oh, definitely. One of the things that I have to deal with in my practice almost on a weekly basis is undoing some information they have gotten from other practitioners that most of the time is because they just don't have enough time to spend with them. Yeah. A lot yeah. of time it's because they haven't continued their education to learn how these things are sure. contributing and they're just throwing a, a program at them or a protocol yeah. at them without even knowing the questions to ask. So when yeah. you, when you've seen clients in the past, what are some myths about the pelvic floor? I know sure. one that I'm just, one easy one is everybody should do Kegels. Kegel all yeah. day. Yeah. <laughs> just do a hundred a day. Yeah. So why would Absolutely. that Absolutely. Um, so the, the main reason is that when, when we look at it in research, what we're seeing is that when we tell people, and then this is mostly with women, so we haven't even really researched it in men, but if you go ask a guy, do a Kegel, they're probably going to be like, I don't know what you're talking about. So in women, right? Women, like we, we are supposed to know what this is. 50% of women have no idea what you're asking them to do when you ask them to do a Kegel. Um, so that's, that's the number one reason why it's, it's kind of, it's definitely poor advice because people don't know what you're, what you're asking them to do. Mm -hmm. Right. But the other reason that it's poor advice is because we don't know that your pain or your dysfunction is, is driven by muscular weakness. So Kegels, which is essentially a pelvic floor muscle contraction, mm -hmm. the, I, the, the reason that people are told to do them is to strengthen their pelvic floor. Um, and again, it's not always the case necessarily that, that women or, or men for that matter have necessarily a weak pelvic floor. I would say what I see often is I actually see, um, pelvic floor muscle tension more so than just these weak pelvic floors that need a whole bunch of exercise. Same thing in body work. <laughs> and, and it's just a great correlation and hopefully people can understand this better is because a lot of the times when they are hurting somewhere, they keep hammering on yeah. the part that they think is the, yeah. the beginning the of the, the actual driver. So they're yeah. hammering on hamstrings or piriformis mm -hmm. or QL or calf muscles. And mm -hmm. they know that's their go-to to try to decompress. Yeah. But typically in that joint and in that fascial line, that's the most well accessible muscle of that line. And something else yeah. along that line is the weak one. And they're feeling the tension and the pain coming from that hypertonic overactive. Yes, the overactive one. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's what you're saying is yeah. with, with the muscles of the pelvic floor, just as every other joint, one could be hypertonic, one mm -hmm. could be weak. And the, and the whole point is being with a practitioner that knows how to look for that, knows how to yeah. test for that, just like I do with the, with the external joints. Yeah. So when you're working with someone, how do you start deciding that? So, you know, the, the first thing really that I, that I do is just a, a movement exam. I want to see how does their lumbar spine move? You know, how do their hips move? Am I, am I, feeling what you're feeling as far as a rotational deficit. And it's, you kind of, you just start stacking up the, from the external piece. And then um, as far as a pelvic floor specific exam, what that looks like is it, it's external and internal. We don't always necessarily have to do an internal exam. And that's always, of course, up to the patient, right? So if they are absolutely like, that is not something I want, it should not be done and they shouldn't be coerced into it. So I kind of wanted to say that first mm -hmm. because I feel like it's really important to have informed consent, but so we educate the person and they have, they, they already know all about it and they're like, no, I want you to check my muscles. So the way that I start is first externally. So they have to undress, right? We've got to visualize the area to mm -hmm. see really what's going on. So externally, we ask them, can you, contract that pelvic floor muscle or can you do a kegel can you lift through the pelvic floor and we can see the perineum move when we're just visualizing so we should be able to see some lift up towards the pelvis when we ask for release it should kind of settle back to rest and then as they bear down the pelvic floor should actually kind of lengthen and bulge out just a little bit so first part of the exam is always just observing 
Can they contract, release, lengthen? Um, and then we go into palpation, right? If we want to know what do these muscles feel like, we have to touch them. Um, we, can, we can touch that superficial layer from the outside, but then we have to go internally to get at those deeper la um, muscle layers. So we I've always a gloved finger, clean, clean glove, um, through the vaginal canal typically because it's kind of easier to get through all layers of the muscle, but just going kind of one by one through, I'll get this little, this little guy out, but you know, just through the vaginal canal, one by one, palpating those muscles. And I'm, you know, through my finger, I'm assessing for what does the tension level feel like. And then I have the client, you know, right along with me, letting me know, is that painful? Is, does it burn? Is there stinging involved? And um, so that's really what the exam looks like. We gotta see what that tissue quality is like in there. So we have a saying in our industry, assess, don't guess. Yeah. And yeah. I would, this is the same thing that you're saying now. I, I, I'm not, I haven't had to deal with this myself, but there isn't there medication that's often given for leakage when someone has bladder leakage? Yeah, there, yeah, there are, there are all kinds of medications. Um, but for the most part, essentially what they do is they're, they're they kind of like dehydrate your body really. Right. right? Um, and it's not, that's not always right going, getting at the root cause. And so when we were talking about myths, one, one thing that I hear a lot is, you know, women will come to me and say, well, I just didn't think it was bad enough. Or, you know, their physician isn't aware that pelvic PT can really help or that it's even a thing or who to send a, a client to. And so they'll say, well, you know, I mean, you, you can have surgery. So do you think it's bad enough that you need surgery? You know, it's, and that's kind of where that, there's like, there's a threshold where don't do anything or it's bad enough to have surgery. And, you know, we're just kind of over here saying like, Hey, you know, before it gets that bad, yeah. like before your whole roof falls in, like, let's just mm -hmm. repair, you know, the part that's not functioning well. That I talk about this often It's a spectrum of care. Yeah. So you have a spectrum sure. of care where your, your surgeons, your, your, standard of care that people are typically getting they can only help you if you're to this point in right. your dysfunction it's right. visible dysfunction vi you know visible and you know you're having such severe symptoms they can only help you once you get there people with your eyes can see yeah. this entire spectrum down here to where the slightest yeah. the very smallest little thing that's not quite normal that's where you can start to keep it from getting to here. Absolutely. So I try to tell everybody anything your body does that's outside the norm or hurts a little bit, or when mm -hmm. I move this way, it doesn't feel right. Anything like that is yeah. simply your body communicating to you that something's not up. Absolutely. So I hear I, I'm a, a burn boot camp member and I hear this all the time when women are jumping rope. Oh, yeah. I leak all the time and they just accept it as normal. Yeah, totally. And is it a normal thing that ha that ha may happen through the course of having children? Yes, but it doesn't have to be right. your life story and, no. and it continues to happen to you. Like I t people tell me all the time, I just don't sleep good. <laughs> like, that's right. not okay. Right. <laughs> your body it. was built to sleep. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And our bodies were built to heal and function correctly. Yeah. So when we're talking about these things about, you know, if you're, if you're experiencing leakage or even bowel issues, yeah. ask your, if they, if your practitioner gives you a pill, say, what does this do to help fix? So right. you start asking questions and most often I would assume they have got to go outside of their, their regular practitioner care because they, like you said, just don't have the training. You know, a lot, a lot of physicians, like you said, yeah, they're, they're, they don't have the training or they don't know, right? They know what they're trained on. So when you go to the urogynecologist who is a surgeon, that's what, that's what they're trained to do, you know? And so you might not be to the level where that's the person that you need to help manage your care. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't mean that there's nobody else in healthcare who can help you with what you need help, you know, what you need help for. And, you know, leaking, for example, um, well, let's talk about like, ur urinary leakage. So there can be is issues or poor functioning at the pelvic floor level, 
but it we can also have issues you know, we talk about the core, that whole middle canister, like this pressure control system. It, it can just be a pressure control issue where, you know, you, you, a lot of us are grippers, right? You see that, you work yes. in LUC grippers. Um, you know, we're either gripping our, our upper, like six pack rectus abs all the time, or we're gripping our glutes, or we're, we're gripping in our shoulders. Well, again, if you're not coming from a place where your body is moving well through all of those areas, it's going to change the way that it can manage pressure, that it can manage load or speed. And so it might not even be a problem in your pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. It may be an abdominal gripping problem. It might be a, a shallow chest breathing, problem. but you're seeing it as the symptom of urinary leakage. So just, again, looking at that whole chain makes the difference because, man, wouldn't it be unfortunate to have surgery to fix, you know, urinary incontinence, but then have still have incontinence because that actually wasn't the problem to begin with. I see that all the time in, yeah. in every, in, in other joints, but sure, another, right. another example of this is if you are constipated yes. and you get treated for gut issues and go through that whole rigmarole of medication and yeah. even dietary intervention. What if there was some trauma in your past that is holding your yeah. posterior back of the pelvic yeah, floor muscles, tight. holding them hostage. And, it, and it's a functional issue of right. stuff not being able to come out. So that's, yeah. you have to look at every angle and I encourage people, you are on a journey of health. Oh, and for if, sure. you're, if you're having symptoms and you're not getting better over a certain right. amount of time, it start, it's time to start asking more questions. Right. So when we talk about <clears throat> pelvic floor care and you know, leaking and stuff like that, in, in my sphere of influence and the people that follow me, one of the first things they all wanted me to ask about was recovering after baby. Postpartum <laughs> return to fitness, right? Yes. When so we all want to know. When can I start working out? Yeah. And it's funny to me too, is we think we're so progressed as a society, but it wasn't that many years ago that we, we were being told to, to stay in bed and rest and don't move yeah. and heal. And my thought process is, yeah, but it wasn't too long before that, that women would have babies and be and back be out right to work. working. So there has yeah. to be a happy medium here. So totally let's does. talk about progressing through pregnancy and how that looks to recover. And so w one thing in, I really just started thinking about this a little bit more, more recently is that we really have to be aware of what, what do we go into pregnancy with, right? So what histories of that chronic low back pain or, you know, what, um, what exercise intensity or demand or whatever, we, we have to know what we went in with because it does sometimes influence what we experience during pregnancy. So I would say there's also a refreshingly a really big move, a big push towards pregnancy and postpartum athleticism and finding the balance between don't do anything, don't lift over 10 pounds and do what you've always been doing. Mm -hmm. And I think the balance really comes in with education, with knowing what does placing a certain low demand or a volume slash frequency of exercise demand on your body do? What, why are you choosing the exercises that you are choosing? For example, if you are 38 weeks pregnant, like why are you choosing toes to bar, for example, just, just to pull any exercise, but you know, what are you hoping to accomplish with that? And I think that is probably one of the most important places to come from when we enter into pregnancy. Mm -hmm. is especially like those of us who are athletic, you know, that, that athlete brain is, well, I'm going to do it because I'm going to show everybody else that I can do it. And this isn't going to stop me. And, but we really have to understand that, um, that core system in the middle is already being, it's being taxed. Okay. First trimester, not so much, but what's being taxed in the first trimester is a lot of us don't feel well extremely fatigued and at that point with your body's just ramping up its its blood volume its overall volume your you know the, the first 14 weeks of forming a, a new human being is like so crucial to you know just just development that it might not be super important to 
keep up with your very high intensity exercise routine. You know, in that season, your body needs nutrition and it needs rest mm -hmm. because it's just because we can't see it doesn't mean it's not doing a lot and it's doing a lot. Um, but then as you progress through, what we want to keep in mind is that your, the mechanics of your body changes as that baby grows, as your uterus grows, right? The, the, um, course, the core canister in the middle changes shape. And so that makes the musculature and the connective tissue maybe less effective really, right? Cause it's designed to work in certain alignments. Mm -hmm. And now we've got this growing uterus. We have the, the rectus um, abdominal muscles splitting apart. That connective tissue down the, our midline is, you know, it thins and it lengthens. Um, we've got the pelvic floor there at the bottom. It, it's now holding up more weight than it had to. And so there's a lot of demand there. Um, and so it, as you know, people, we do need to listen to our bodies, but I think we need to know what to listen for, right? Because that's one of the pieces of advice. But if we don't know what we're listening for, you know, heaviness or pressure, and sometimes our, our body gives us subtle hints of what it needs. And, you know, for those of us who have a, a strong athlete brain, we just, we've always gone right through that, right? We don't want to listen to the subtle thing. Like, yeah. I'm not going to stop until I have that quad tear, right? <laughs> like, so I think it's knowing what, what are we, um, what are we supposed to be listening for mm -hmm. and giving ourselves that permission that I'm not like necessarily proving anything to anyone. You can still be fit during pregnancy, but, but scale back on your intensity, your volume, your demand that you are placing on yourself while respecting that you are growing a human being inside of you. And that's a lot. A good comparison to that is health in general. And when you yeah. are thinking about how, so my definition of health and what I've heard people say before is not the absence of sickness or disease. It's how quickly you can recover from it and how exacerbated the symptoms are. Sure. So in my mind, if you are thinking about starting a family, that is the time that year before oh, yeah. you get your body as strong and stable as possible so that yeah. pregnancy and delivery can go more smoothly yeah. for you. Because what I hear all the time, I was just vacuuming or I turned to get out of the car and something yeah. popped or pulled or yeah. that's where I, when I got hurt, I'm like, no, that, that called out what was already there. Right. That right. was the tipping point for that joint or part of the body that said, I'm not taking any more. Mm -hmm. So pregnancy, I hear, I mean, I do prenatal massage. So yeah. I hear so often my sciatic pain is so bad. I'm, I'm getting thoracic outlet syndrome, yeah. a carpal tunnel. It, pregnancy didn't cause that. Right. You were, there was already a very dysfunctional joint and yeah. now adding in all of these new stimuli yeah. is calling out dysfunctional patterning that was already there. So I think that's a great analogy is it's just like preventative health care. Get healthy so that you can recover. Definitely. Planning for pregnancy, get your body strong and stable on all sides of every joint so that it can all end up better. Right. So when we're talking about even in a situation where you have a strong, stable physical body and you go through delivery, all kinds of crazy things can happen. You never know. <laughs> like it's, it's, you never know. Yeah. It, every, every delivery can be, every birth can be different. Every pregnancy can be different. I mean, so talk to us a little bit about, and anyone that's listening to this hasn't had children yet. Don't be scared. No. Don't be scared. If the more knowledge you have, the better you yeah. can go through these things. The problem I see is people weren't educated and had a traumatic experience. Yeah. And that trauma is a precursor to years of yeah. pain and dysfunction. So if we know the possibilities of some things that can happen, we can better start to plan. So talk to me about some of the things that can happen in delivery to the pelvic floor that would result in damage and therefore pain and dysfunction in the future. You know, I think the most common thing with, um, with a vaginal delivery is a perineal tear. So it's as, um, I'll just use this little paper one again, but right as baby comes through the, the vaginal canal, 
this little area here between the vagina and the anus is called the perineal body. And it often tears because, you know, we're trying to get a big baby out of like what was a relatively small space. You know, of course, our, the pelvic floor muscles along with the connective tissue, everything does dilate and open up to make room for that baby coming through. But sometimes we'll, we'll create a tear. Um, there's different grades of tearing that happens from a level one, which is pretty minor, up to a four, and a four includes a full, um, a full tear right from the vaginal mucosa through that rectal mucosa. And so when it takes a, you know, it usually takes a surgical to, to get that better. Lucky thing is those aren't super common. So what is super common are those ones and twos. And um, a one, they'll usually leave it alone. They won't do anything to it. A two, they might put a couple of stitches in. Um, typically, they're dissolvable. But what, what's important to know is that, again, with anything that the body feels as traumatic, I mean, birth is beautiful. It's wonderful. You have this amazing baby. But at the same time, your body says, what just happened? Yeah. right? And you might potentially have some stitches in your vagina and that's going to be sore. So we want to kind of respect the healing process, not only the external healing process, I think, um, but also what our body is doing from the inside. And so when people ask me, you know, how soon, how soon after birth can I start working out? For sure, those first two weeks should be laying low, um, you know, it, just bonding with your baby, taking, you know, you and baby's needs and only worrying about that. Like exercise should be totally not even in your forefront. Mm -hmm. Make sure, yeah, you get up, you walk around the house. That's different than exercising. Um, but we need to give our body some time to heal, you know, those tears from the outside and also the, um, inside of our uterus, right? So this is another thing more, recently than I'd like to admit, um, I never really realized how large the placenta is. I, did you, did you just post something about that? Cause I saw that too. And it's like, yeah, taking a huge piece of real huge. estate away from the body. Right. Like, right. <laughs> exactly. So that's what's healing on the inside of you. This, um, I've heard people describe it as almost as like a dinner plate size wound Being ripped off yeah inside your uterus and so that i think is also a consideration that most of us again don't even realize here i am physical therapist and you know after my first baby and mind you i had c-sections on top of this like abdominal surgeries and i'm three and a half weeks out and i'm gonna go for a run today because i feel good i think back to like me from eight years ago i was like what are you thinking like you not only had like an abdominal surgery, but this huge wound on the inside. Um, so those are the, the considerations I think there for postpartum return to exercise. So perineal tearing is pretty common, you know, um, and it's typically minor. Um, and he usually heals really well. Sometimes you'll end up with a little longer lasting um, discomfort at that perineal body area or um, just on the outside of your vagina or maybe just inside your vagina. Um, and that can be treated really well with some scar desensitization, some tissue mobilization, just kind of getting that scar tissue to move better. Um, a little less, and definitely less frequently, you know, sometimes the pelvic floor muscles more deeper inside can kind of tear. We call that an avulsion. Um, I haven't seen that often at all. Mm -hmm. um, and one other thing that I sometimes see is um, nerve compression injuries, um, pushing back with your, with your um, hips flexed up, right? So you've got like the femoral nerve that comes through that, that front of the hip there, and we can really compress it if we are pushing for a long time on our back with our, with our legs pulled up. Right. Um, so if you, so again, if you're already going in with a rotated pelvis because it's not stable and then you exaggerate it even more and add pressure, yeah, it's, you're, you're setting yourself up for some low back pain. So my, one of my questions would be then if someone has that perennial tear and it's the level four, how soon can they come see you for just to look at it see what's going on, maybe even start some therapy and the scar tissue. So 
in, in my world, when I'm talking about a dysfunctional joint or pain, and I know there's a scar anywhere around that area, really anywhere, yeah. scars take priority yeah. because it totally changes the dynamic yeah. of how those fascial lines are moving. Yes. So when yeah. someone has a tear and maybe if it's a level four or even not, yeah. they don't always, they're not always real kind about how they throw that tissue back together. And no, it. yeah, not always. It, you're at the mercy of your, of whoever providers there, right? Correct. Um, so we, we like to, before scar massage, four to six weeks, but I, you know, if you are feeling okay and you want to get out, I'm happy with seeing people two weeks postpartum. You know, give that two weeks of rest and then because we don't always need to start right on that scar right the fascial lines right so we can work further away mm -hmm. but still affect that tissue both the, the muscle and the connective tissue yeah um, even just getting your body in and around your pelvis or this is for c-section scars too mm -hmm. you know I'm I see moms two weeks postpartum with a c-section scar because you know you have it you have four six inch long you typically horizontal incision there and it has gone through seven eight layers of you know skin and fascia and and fat and muscle and things like that and at, you know they're all sutured pretty nicely but at the same time like we we're not really sure every person's body heals lays down scar differently yep. right some more flexible no problems others are just like these these brick walls where kind of all of those layers that should be moving independently on each other now they're just zipped up right on top of each other it's like i can't i can't tell you how much i agree with this and i see this because i feel it so when, oh, yeah i mean when so many of my female clients come to me with back pain one of the, mm -hmm. I mean, one of the intake questions is, did you have a C-section or in myself included any abdominal surgery? Any abdominal I've, surgery, yeah. I've had three surgeries for ovarian cysts. One was a borderline cancerous tumor that had to be removed. So mm -hmm. I have the cut, it didn't go into the uterus, but to remove that tumor, they had to do a cut. Right. So when I'm palpating around the abdominals, and this is a side note, if you're getting body work and you're looking for good clinical body work to help you with pain if you're not getting someone to touch your abdominal your belly and see what's going on you need to find a different practitioner yeah when i'm palpating around that c-section scar you're exactly right with some they people true. my mind is blown because it feels like a cement block yeah so one way i get them to understand how important that is in in associating that with their back pain is when, while they're dressed and clothed, I'll have them stand up, raise both arms above their head and find no problem. And I'll take their shirt at their belly and hold it in my hand and twist it yeah. and ask them to raise their hands again. And they can't, um, right. this is what you've been dealing with on not just your shoulders, yeah. not being able to move, but your hips not being able to move. So the scar, the scarring is so important. So going back to your treatment plans, if anyone has if they're entering pregnancy with pain they know or they already have or a history of surgeries like myself or an injury in that part of the body it would be hugely beneficial to just have a check-in appointment with yeah. you oh two definitely weeks. so two yeah. weeks after delivery hey do do a intake on me kind of see what's going on because you're exactly yep. right i don't have to touch that area no nope. by helping you be more mentally connected to that part of the body yeah. I'm sure you teach breathing techniques to help yeah. with the diaphragm. Yep. We're going to prevent that from ever being an issue, but we don't know that if they're not getting looked at. Right. Right. Um, and so that perfect, the breathing stuff, um, we like to refer to it like the, as the connection breath, right? So we meant, I mentioned the diaphragm and the pelvic floor are the roof and the floor of the core and we have a rhythmic um, movement that happens with inhalation and exhalation on inhalation right everything kind of shifts down and that's what gives us that feeling of like our belly expanding mm -hmm. our rib cage opens up the the belly or the abdomen kind of in a 360 way um, 
it opens up and then the pelvic floor on the bottom kind of descends down and stretches just a little bit. And then on exhalation, we get this kind of rubber banding, pistoning kind of effect where everything kind of settles back to where it came from. So just through breathing, we have this motion going on in all of these spots. And so when, when um, postpartum moms come to me, whether it's, you, you know, two weeks or three we're years always, postpartum, we're always 10 years, postpartum. We're always we're postpartum. Always, yeah, we're always postpartum. Yeah. But if you, if you don't have the awareness of how is your body moving when you're just resting, you know, that's that make yourself quiet and make yourself turn your attention inward because boy, do we not do that a lot, do we? Nope. Especially, especially, you know, once you throw kids into the mix, it's like you're always doing for somebody else. Yes. But we've got to, we've got to um, be able to turn our attention inside so that we can, we can feel what's going on or we can feel where things are blocked or stuck. And a lot of times that's in the, that's in the pelvic floor or the, you know, the lower abdominal wall. Mm -hmm. um, so connection breathing, which I mean, it's just exactly what it sounds like. It's taking 10 minutes a day to simply turn your attention inward, specifically focus on the rib cage, then your abdominal wall, maybe your upper abdominal wall, lower abdominal wall. And then what do you feel in your pelvis? You know, what do you feel between those, those ischial tuberosities, the bones in your butt cheeks. What do you feel between your pubic bone and your tailbone? Do you feel anything? Do you feel like, I don't even know how to pay attention down there? Yeah. You know, yeah. so, yeah. right? Yeah. We, that's kind of, that's place number one um, that I want everyone to start because if you don't have an awareness and if you can't feel movement or you can't feel the muscles, how are you gonna know how to activate them, you know? So, not going to <laughs> right but and, and you know and it also helps with the scar stuff and it helps um it helps to kind of r relax our nervous system so that it's not on this high alert you know something terrible is going to happen um you know which can can help with pain control and those kind of things mm -hmm. too so it's a physical part and it's also the neurological part yes that the connection breath really helps with so when we're talking about injury and again, however it got there, there are now medical devices that can be mm -hmm. used internally yeah. when there is a lack of support. So talk a little bit about that when they're needed, if they're being used wrong, if therapy could have prevented that yeah. to me, for, I, the thought of that freaks me out, but I know it would be necessary sometimes. So tell us about those yeah, there's, right. So there's all kinds of things that we can use. And I think that there's absolutely like a time and a place for whether you want to use a Kegel trainer or you're going to use a pessary. So a pessary is a plastic, sometimes they're a disc, sometimes they're a cube, but they're usually plastic or silicone. And what we use them for is for pelvic organ prolapse. So if you have some uterine prolapse or some bladder prolapse, they're kind of, they're essentially like these space occupying items, right? And so you can insert them vaginally for more support. There's all, almost all um, devices can be useful. Um, for some people say like with pain, we might recommend dilators. The only time I would say, don't just jump to buying yourself a device, right? Mm -hmm. Find a professional who can evaluate everything and come up with a plan together. And that's when I think you're gonna find the most uh, effective and safe use of any device that you, that you may wanna use. You know, you might be one of those people who really does have like a weak pelvic floor and you may benefit from a Kegel trainer if you're someone who likes techie things and you think it's gonna help you to, you know, be consistent with your exercises, then by all means, work, find your professional, have an evaluation, and you guys work together on um, a plan with your device and progression with that device. Same thing with using a pessary or using the dilators. There are um, vaginal wands that we can use, or even rectal wands, that you can use for um, kind of those short and tight pelvic floor muscles that maybe need some tissue work or some massage kind of work. Mm -hmm. The same thing. Don't just go buying them and then poking around and, you know, yeah. um, 
it's the same thing with body work. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm going to buy this massage gun. I'm going to use a foam roller on this part of my body. Yeah. I'm going to buy a shoe insert for this foot because I was told I had one leg longer than the other. Right. You know, just because you, in, 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 as in every industry, yeah. products are created to make someone money and mm-hmm. they're really good at advertising. That doesn't mean that that's what you need. And right. another thing I tell people is, okay, if you need external support for a while, and in this case, internal, fine. But like you mm-hmm. said, let's work together to where you, you aren't relying on that. Yeah. You yeah. become reliant on that thing and then you don't have it for a period of time. Dysfunction happens even quicker and more drastic. Absolutely. So yeah. again, just a reminder to everyone, if you've yeah. been advised to use one of these things from a practitioner that may know well what they're talking about, but they also don't know how to help the area get better, right. do the thing you think you need to do and get with someone like yourself yeah. that knows how to help the area find stability, find strength or find decompression. Cause if it needs decompression, sure. that's what it needs. Yeah. So don't just, if you've been prescribed a product, don't think that's the answer. You got to ask more questions. Man, it's, it's always, you know, it's always, if it's accessible, it's always a great idea and a benefit to work with someone who can, you know, come alongside you, support you, coach you, um, you know, and just make sure or help you to do things as safely and as, as beneficial as possible, you know? Yeah. Um, I think the same thing sometimes with, with certain exercise programs or, you know, there's a lot of diastasis, recti rehab things out there. Well, you know, there's also a lot of women who think they have a diastasis, but, you know, they, maybe they have an abdominal hernia or they think that they have diastasis and, um, it's, it's just not right. It's, it can be, a, our skin changes, mm-hmm. our skin changes after having babies, unfortunately. Um, okay. and, and every, ahead. you know, everybody has different genetics with different connective tissues. And that means that our, I mean, no matter what, your body's going to look different after you have a baby compared to before you had a baby. So, so let's go ahead and jump into diastasis recti. Tell everybody what it is, um, what happens when you don't get it treated, how you start to treat it. Oh man. So, okay. So diastasis recti is, um, you know what? Let me just see really quick. I can't remember if I have. While you're looking for that, this is another one of those things where you're told that you have it. So I'm going to start doing crunches to make my core stronger. Yeah. You're just going to hurt your back. (laughs) (laughs) So again, don't just listen to you have something and you pick it out. We need to stop self-diagnosing because if you're, if you're putting in all this effort and all this work, but you're not doing it to the right body part, you are going to make the problem worse because you're taking a part of fascia, maybe the scarring or whatever that's, that's there because it's trying to help protect a weak area. And then you're contracting muscles on top of it and not getting that, that dynamic of where is the weakness, where is the hypertonus and getting that figured out. So diastasis recti is, is, is essentially um, when you can see the, the, the line of connective tissue. So the muscles we're looking at are the rectus abdominis. Those are the ones that'll give you that six pack look and straight down the midline of our body through the belly button area is um, the line of connective tissue called linea alba. And it, it's really just kind of the line connecting the left and the right sides. And what is normal during pregnancy is that this connective tissue thins and lengthens and stretches out because you are growing a baby inside of you. So you need room. And um, so that is a totally normal process. So I have been seeing and hearing so many pregnant moms, like women who are actively, who are pregnant in the middle of pregnancy, you know, middle of second trimesters at third trimesters um, saying, I have a diastasis. I have a diastasis. Of course you do. You're supposed to. Um, but what we're not supposed to do it, or, or what we should refrain from doing, right, is kind of stressing that line of connective tissue. It goes back to that whole pressure, like the pressure management thing, um, that the core, our, our middle, is doing its best to help us manage pressure in really everything that we do um, in life brings pressure into our body, some things more so than others. If I pick up my three-year-old or if I pick up the couch, like those are two different loads and one causes more pressure to my body. So in pregnancy, 
you're going to, you might notice that down the midline of, of your belly, when you pick up one of your older children or you're still, you know, snatching 150 pounds or whatever you're doing that, that you see, you see that the tissue at the midline kind of rounding out, um, you know, we'll call it like, like a, a mound or, um, you know, you'll see that through the midline, you'll see it kind of puffing out. And so this can stick with us after pregnancy where the tissue in the midline there is, is just not great at, um, at, at becoming taut when we load it. So there's also, I mean, diastasis, man, this is, it, this is such an area where we need a ton of research and we're, we're getting there, but we don't have, we don't have great answers right now. So you know, the way that we used to kind of assess diastasis of do you have it or do you not was how, how wide is that gap? Is it one finger? Is it two fingers between those two sides of the muscle? Is it three centimeters? There's all these ways. And what we found was that um, looking at how far is the gap is really an unreliable measure of, you know, do they have a dysfunctional connective tissue muscle system? Um, so now when, when we're assessing or when you do, when you do get assessed, if you're getting assessed and someone's only kind of going down and saying, Oh, you, you know, you only have a one finger gap. You're good. Get another assessment because, um, that's not, it's really not done anymore. We we're going to still poke around and we may remark, you know, just a, kind of how the width is, but really what we want to see is in, in different positions. So in standing, as you lift something, as you, you know, maybe you're pulling or pushing a, a band, for example, um, even with lying down and kind of still the head and shoulder lift or a sit up, um, in all of these different positions, what does, what does the tissue feel like when it gets loaded? And, you know, what does it look like? Is there that dome there? Is there that ridge there? Um, because that kind of gives us an idea of what, again, how is the whole system managing pressure and how is that tissue in the midline responding when we load it? And we're really using that midline tissue of the linea alba to, to give us a good idea of really, again, we talked about that, that abdomen is, is 300 is 360 and the, the muscles are multi-layered with multiple layers of connective tissue so we're using the, the external piece there of that linea alba down the middle. That's what we're using as our assessment for kind of like what is the whole system doing together. Yeah. Um, yeah. One thing I remind my clients of, and it would be the same thing you, you just said, is a diagnosis is simply an observation. Mm -hmm. It doesn't do anything for you. So if a mm -hmm. practitioner says you have this, go strengthen your core, that's not enough. What no. part of your core? Right. The flexion extension part, the rotation part, Right. Do I need so, some scar tissue before I do any work? Yeah. What, what do I do? An, a diagnosis is just an observation. Yes. So you have to get with someone that knows what to yes. do with that observation. Yep. Um, I was going to, two things popped up in my head to ask. One is after you have, after, after the baby's delivered, do you like the idea of the wrapping this, um, yeah, I think it can be, I think it can be useful, um, for, you know, three, four weeks or so. I like it. I, I don't like it super tight, right? So the idea isn't wrap yourself up to get skinny. <laughs> the idea, right, is just you, you had an eight or a nine, 10 pound baby inside of you that was occupying all of this space. So your organs have really shifted around. We've had a lot of lengthening of connective tissue and now baby's out. So now there's all this extra space as your organs try and kind of find their way back to, you know, where they were, where they, where they're going to settle. And so th that like the, the binding or the wrapping that can be just really nice for some people, you know, for some people it makes them feel like, Oh, I, I, I feel confident moving, you know, sometimes just you feel like you're almost swimming around in your own body. Yes. So, yeah. So it would be the same, like we just said, it, it's a tool that can yep. help, yep. but don't like people with back braces. Yeah. Wearing a back brace all day long to get through your day. Now you're reliant on the back brace and your body's not even trying to have stability. Yeah. 
So again, I think what you're saying is use it as a tool, yeah. but how long are you using it? What hours of the day are you using it? Right. How do we start progressing down out of using that as much? Right. Um, and then also I was going to ask about yoga. So are you a fan of yoga before pregnancy, during pregnancy, after pregnancy? I love, I say all of it. Yeah. Uh, and I personally wish that I had more free time to get to classes, but yeah, I, I really do like it. And I think, you know, I mean, yoga is again, like every other profession, we have amazing yoga teachers. And then we have people who, you know, kind of have done like minimal training and, you know, they maybe they're just not as knowledgeable. Um, and I also think it's, you know, it, it you have to find a, a teacher um, who aligns with you and what you're looking for too. So I, I think it's great. Um, it can just be such an amazing way to tie in some of the, um, like the mind and the body that I, so I love it yeah. and I think it's great. Yeah. Yeah. And going back to what I was talking about with scarring, if you, again, you're, you plan for everything and hope for nothing. Right. But when, when you have any scarring, the old idea of rest, ice, compress, elevate is yeah. not right anymore. We've proven right. that by science and cellularly, that's not how we should do things. Right. We want to heal along the lines of movement. Yes. And when you're in recovery from an injury or a delivery, you want to find that movement that doesn't make your body afraid. Right. It doesn't send you into fight or flight. It's not too much too fast. Right. But as you are moving, you're asking your body to find stability and balance. So I concur. I think we should be moving in whatever way is good for us during yes. these times of recovery, but becoming immobile is the worst thing we can do. And so I always oh, remind people, don't jump into CrossFit the week after delivery. And yeah, if it hurts, week after. <laughs> yeah, listen, listen to your body. If it hurts, stop doing it. And again, what I teach my people is if it hurts, regress it back to where it doesn't. Yeah. And then yeah. start there and then start adding, which is again, why need, people need your eyes on them because you can say, oh, I can see when you're trying to do that, you're actually not even using the right muscles, back it up, do it this way for two weeks, then right. we'll add on to it. And that's right. the value of having someone like you assessing them. You know, I think also from a postpartum standpoint, um, looking at we, over those 40 weeks, because your center of mass has changed, um, you know, your whole core structure has changed, your movement patterns change, mm -hmm. you know, and, and then you go and you try and, and do whatever exercise that you were doing before, or even you're just doing life and these aches and pains creep up and you're like, what the heck? Um, and you know, sometimes it's just looking at the movement pattern and we, a lot of times we'll get stuck in a certain movement pattern mm -hmm. and we didn't even realize it yeah. or we'll get stuck in a certain posture and we didn't even realize it. So, you know, postpartum, the first couple of weeks, definitely, I, I just like rest. Mm -hmm. Um, and then if you have the ability to get with a pelvic physical therapist, for sure, try to do that somewhere between two and four weeks. But at that two week mark, you know, what I like to have people start doing is, um, is just some gentle activation. Just can you connect with through your abdominal wall? So can you get the, the deep abdominal wall muscle, that transverse abdominus? Can we get that engaging and releasing? So not necessarily thinking exercises like I got to strengthen, but it's more like, can I get my brain and the transverse abdominus talking to each other? Yeah. Can I get my brain and my pelvic floor? So can I you know, can I do a little bit of a lift? Can mm -hmm. I release out of that lift? Can I bear down and kind of open through the pelvic floor? So can I coordinate that? And can I do those movements? So we're just getting everything back online with each other. Can I take a deep breath again? Mm -hmm. right? It's the simple things that simple. are the hardest for everyone oh. to do, including my strongest athletes. Yeah. They're, yeah. We have, I have a friend that said, you know, they're, they're the most dysfunctional. They're just the best at hiding it because they're the best compensators. Right. But some and of them have the worst right. core strength and stability. So again, yeah. it's finding a practitioner that can see these things to prevent chronic right. pain down the road. Right. So talking about pain, we're going to move from delivery and recovery mm -hmm. from that into another area of life that is extremely important and can cause a lot of emotional turmoil mm. 
is painful sex. Yeah. So this is something, yeah. that, again, that mind body connection yeah. with this part of your body, you can't not think about that every minute of every day. Yeah. So again, whatever got yeah. you to the place where you have dysfunction or pain or trauma, when you have someone you're working with, it, sex is just painful to them. Yeah. How do you start helping that? Yeah. So we, you know, we, we see, we see the whole gamut, you know, we see teenagers to women in their eighties, nineties, you know, who are wanting to be sexually active in, in camp because of pain. And, you know, along, along usually with the painful intercourse stuff also comes, you know, if you're of menstruating age, you can't use a tampon, you can't use a menstrual cup. Um, you know, and GYN exams are another form of trauma for women who have, who have, um, vaginismus, which is like, um, muscle, the pelvic floor muscles are just very contracted. Mm -hmm. Um, or dyspareunia is just the name for painful intercourse it could be, you know, insertional, it could be deeper, it could be anything. But a lot of times those two things go hand in hand with painful GYN exams. Mm -hmm. And so now we have a health risk, right? Because if you can't get, if you can't give your health exams, you know, <laughs> that we need pap smears. We need, um, you know, we need manual exams sometimes. So anyway, um, when we're working with women who have painful intercourse, it can be, you know, there can be a host of things that we, that we see. Um, sex is, it's not just, a, it's not just physical, right? Like I think sometimes we kind of certain providers or certain people in healthcare are like, it, it was just a physical thing. Like, you know, for men, just give them a pill and that's fine. Or, you know, for women, I mean, drink a glass, like drink a glass of wine and relax and everything will be fine. But yeah, man, it's like, it's an, it's emotional. It's like psycho emotional. It's spiritual. It's, um, there, there are all of these cultural beliefs and societal beliefs around, around sex and around the female body and what is, you know, the whole good and bad and being a good female or good girl versus not. And, you know, so there's a lot of that stuff that it, it's there. Yes. It's there to all different levels. Um, and with that, we just need more, more counselors who are trained in just sexual dysfunctions or just trained in sex and couples and counseling and um, that kind of stuff, because there's so much of that and, and that can affect how you re like receive sex or, you know, are, how your body's ready for it or not, you know? So if you've got a lot of this stuff from a mind, um, emotional or, you know, mind standpoint, that's going to put the brakes on how your body receives. Right. Um, and so putting the brakes on, it looks like a lot of things. It looks like that butt gripping. It looks like the inner thigh gripping. It looks like hypertonic or just really tense pelvic floor muscles. It looks like a reaction to simple touch, mm -hmm. you know? And so just depending on the person, it may be establishing trust through working some lumbar spine stuff, maybe working through the abdomen, lower abdomen, maybe the thighs, you know, maybe we're not even near the pelvis at first. Um, there, you know, other reasons for painful intercourse, certainly um, with the use of hormonal birth control or just through aging and through menopause, um, having low levels of estrogen, for example, you know, will make the tissue less pliable. Um, it, it's not as flexible. It's not as hydrated. So those can be issues um, that we we'll sometimes have to look at. And sometimes we have like scar stuff, you know, um, women who've had those, those perineal tears or they've had other surgeries. Um, even things like, um, like the leap procedures, you know, for um, cervical dysplasia, like when they go in and kind of clip some of the cervix. Anything that happens in and around the pelvis that is traumatic or hurts or is painful, constipation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how many, how many Americans, I, I think I just heard the other day and it might've been Mark Hyman, Dr. Hyman, who said this, that GI dysfunction is the number one reason that people in America visit their primary care providers now. Yep. Everyone's got some GI dysfunction, like, you know, and in, in, in it's, it stems in inflammation and man, you know, your organs, 
live right next door to your pelvic floor muscles and connective tissue. And, you know, inflammation doesn't just stay in the organ, right? It's going to encompass everything around it. So, um, you know, we definitely try and take a, a look at a lot of lifestyle stuff that could be in, impacting it and then work on some of the, if, if, you, if it is an, an instance where we have a lot of tension in that pelvic floor, you know, how can we start to kind of release some of that tension? You know, maybe it's through breath work. Maybe it's through some um, meditation, calm app kind of stuff during the day, um, through simple pelvic mobility movements. You know, there are so many people who cannot rock their pelvis forward and backward. It's like a brick. It's like a brick that is just this like one big rectangle from like their neck, right? Right down to their tail. Like this. Yes. You know, so nothing's moving. Of course, you know, if, if it's not moving freely outside of sex, it's not going to move during sex either. Right, right. right. You know? So for in your just like a, just a ballpark number or percentage, when you're working with people and they, they're coming to you for this reason, how, like a percentage wise, is it uh, a past, you know, injury or surgery or do you connect it more to that psycho-emotional? Um... Man, it's, I think it's hard to give a percentage. I think that I think that almost almost everyone that I see has some combination of both things. Mm-hmm. Um, even even if it's uh, for okay, let's take the postpartum thing for example. Even if it's the pain was there because I had that tear and I had those stitches. And, but now my husband and I have tried like five or six times to have sex and every time it's been excruciating, guess what? Now what does our brain think? Our brain thinks that area is is going to hurt me. Yeah. 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 Um, so there's, there's a lot of times that a combination of, of both things, but a lot of times, you know, it's, it's the initial, the initial onset of it is even, you know, women, it's usually like younger women too, like maybe who've just gotten married, hadn't been sexually active before that, or even like later teens were like, you know, I've never been able to use a tampon. And I, you know, I've just started being sexually active and it's really, it's really hurts. Um, and we'll go back and it's like, oh yeah, I had, I've always had constipation. I've always had these, these gut problems. Yeah. So it, they're so it, in the pelvis again, so many systems live with each other yep. that they all affect each other. Not, not one can function by itself. No. no. So what I like to remind people of is that, you know, they would think to themselves, well, I need to go see this person for this or that person for that. Cause that's their specialty. And again, we're marrying all of them. We're marrying right. the, the physical, mental, and emotional. We need to put them together and not treat them separately. So right. oh, definitely. you go see your mental health practitioner to help with that side of it. But where you come into play is connecting the mind back to the body and in a non-sexual way so that the brain's not even there, you're providing a safe space to receive palpation. Mm -hmm. That starts, it's just like massage. The way some people, and I don't even know what they're recovering from. It could be some type of past trauma, but they've disassociated so much with their body or they're that mom that's taking care of the kids and puts their body on the back burner for years and years and doesn't even think about it or hates that C-section scar, gained the weight and doesn't like their body. So they disassociate. The reason that massage body work and especially you with those specific things is so helpful in Pro, promoting a quicker recovery time is you become safe in your body. Yeah. So the body keeps the score is one of my favorite books. Yes. And so that's what he talks about is if you're trying to heal, you have to get your physical biological thing in a space where you feel safe. Yeah. And if you're doing that in this situation where sex is painful, you put yourself with a practitioner like yourself that knows how to view the body, how to communicate with the body, and you can start receiving palpation yeah. and care in a way that doesn't make you go into that, into that fight or flight, that steps forward in your healing and recovery to where you can experience the wonderful, beautiful, intimate things mm-hmm. of life that you may not even be able to get to if you just keep pushing them away yeah. or worse of all, force yourself into it. Yeah. So that's one of the things I want to push home with people is again, if your body is giving you some type of signal that something's up, yeah, you got to find a practitioner that says, well, why? 
Mm-hmm. Why, why does the body respond that way? How can yeah. I help it not respond that way? I'm going to work on it physically in this moment, but I'm also going to refer you to this mental health care practitioner. Yeah. And we all as a community of healthcare providers work together and that's where we see the most benefit. Um, I'm going to touch quickly and you can just touch quickly on men because they have yeah. a pelvic floor too. They have um, a pelvic floor too. Yeah. <laughs> they don't know it. <laughs> I know. Right. But I mean, I, I have had cases with clients that yeah. they have told me they've had falls and have damaged. Yes. So that's, of course, they don't have children. They don't have delivery, but they definitely have anatomy that can get damaged for all sorts of different reasons. So talk to us a little bit about the guys. So absolutely. I mean, they have very similarly structured pelvic floor, except for kind of as some of the pelvic floor muscles that kind of run on the sides of our vagina. For them, it goes up there, up the shaft of the penis. But really, other than that, I mean, it pretty much similar. Mm -hmm. Um, so you're right. Injuries, injuries in the male pelvic floor will create the same dysfunctions that they do in the female pelvic floor. One, you can have avulsions, Mm -hmm. right? So where the the pelvic floor muscles kind of rip away from their attachments of the bones, you can have just the type of damage that you described, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's a fall, you know, sometimes you'll hear like, Oh, I was, I was younger and I was like jumping over the fence. Yep. Um, or I just uh, slip and fall on your tailbone, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, guys, guys hold stress in their pelvis the exact same way that women do. So, um, men that I have worked with who have a lot of pelvic pain, right? So they'll either have testicular pain, rectal pain, pain down the shaft of their penis, any of it. And, you know, a lot of these guys are very, um, high, like high stress. They're very type A kind of driven people with, um, demanding jobs and those kind of things. You know, those are the guys that are, they're coming in. They got three phones. My, my CEO types. I yes. know, I know them yep. so well and yep. I make them leave their phone in the car. And they're, yeah, they're, and they always have like two or three phones. Yeah. Like yeah. And they've got all this stuff in their pockets. Um, yeah. So, you know, we see that. And then, you know, guys, also have anatomy in their pelvises that sometimes have other disease processes, right? So, um, prostate cancer, mm-hmm. um, and, and, you know, they're having, they're having surgery to remove their prostate. And the, so the prostate acts as kind of one of the, um, stoppers on the urethra. So this is why when we remove it, guys can experience more urinary leakage because it's kind of like you took away one of, you took away one of the kinks right you straighten out one of the kinks so now it flows through freely through there and we've just got the pelvic floor muscles working as the lone sphincter Mm -hmm. so um you know we will work with guys a lot who have before their prostate surgeries ideally right for the same reason they don't even know how to connect to their pelvic floor so let's not operate on them and then ask them to do it let's have them learn first then they have their surgery and then they come back in scar is the same consideration Um, you know, some of these guys are going for radiation treatments that that radiates that entire area kind of, you know, just, just behind the testicles and, you know, in front of the anus and, and that creates its own, you know, scarring and those kind of issues for them. So, you know, they, all the same issues, um, minus the baby. Minus the baby. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So so again, just to, just to press home that point. If, if anything's up, you have to be able to yeah, have a practitioner yeah. that can answer the question, yeah. why? Yeah. How did it get that way? Why? And yeah. what do we do about it? Not just medicate, not yeah. just numb, not just muscle relaxers and painkillers. Mm-hmm. Why? And then refer out if we need to. You know, sometimes we'll see guys for sexual dysfunction problems too. And that's where, you know, that initial session of just having that conversation with with them, we really have to dig into some of their their lifestyle factor stuff, the relationship stuff, um, you know, because they're dealing with all of the same things. And man, if it, you know, as women are talking about it, like the guys are talking about it even less. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) So one of my little tricks that I have, because, you know, as we have been doing this for a long time, you and I, we can kind of tell even before we meet a client face to face by their intake form, if they fill it out online before they come in, you can kind of tell by the wording of their sentences, how long of a health history they give you and how many words. And then when they come into the office, the energy that they walk yeah. in, 
I can, t I can usually tell right away when there's a big emotional or traumatic event around it besides yeah. just sitting at the desk. I can usually tell that. So one of my tricks is obviously I'm going to work with the body because that's my specialty. I'm going to help the body calm down and all those good things. But in the intake process, what I do is I have them sit in the chair that I'm going to talk to them in. And I have a big uh, exercise ball in my room that that's what I use to sit on. And I roll it up real close to them. And I get real close to them like this. And I say, I just kind of stop and look at them because nobody looks at anybody anymore. No. <laughs> and so I just get real close and I look them in the eye and say, what do you think is causing this pain? Yeah. And they usually start crying and say something outside of the realm of the body. And I'm like, that's what you need to work on yeah. this weekend. I'm going to help your body feel better today. But that thing that just made you cry that's what is keeping you in a chronic yeah. state of pain. So yeah. I love that question too, because, you know, in just in our medical system, we don't, nobody's got time, mm -hmm. right? You have what five, if you're at a physician, you're usually have like five to seven minutes. That's actually your time, right? So a lot of time, especially uh, primarily women that more recently, but just the tell me your story. Like nobody wants to hear a story. Everybody wants to hear, just tell me what hurts. Yeah. No, tell me, I need to know what do you think right. is going on? Mm -hmm. Because it, no one's asking. You and know? as a practitioner, like you mm -hmm. and I are doing, when you tell us more, that's able for us to know how to help you better, yeah. whether it be our technique or I need to bring in this practitioner with mm -hmm. us and work alongside with them to get yeah. you well. It's not just what I can do. It's us working right. together as a team. So just a couple things left before yeah. we end this amazing episode. The first thing would be, what are some actionable steps that we can start doing if someone has problems, they heard this or like that, so much of that resonated with me. What's a couple things that, that people could start doing on their own or stop doing that could help? Yeah, so starting would be, it's some form of meditation, soft belly breathing, connection breath, taking time to yourself to feel your own body mm. because your body will lead you right to exactly what doesn't feel right. Yeah. But we're just not listening. We're not taking the time to do it. Um, and then on the flip side, what can we stop doing? One, we can stop over scheduling ourselves we can stop setting up these ridiculous, unrealistic Instagram expectations on our life, especially moms. Mm. Um, and especially right now, like this whole quarantine schooling, I don't know how old your kids are, but quarantine school. <laughs> Give yeah. yourself grace is what you're oh, saying. Yes, correct. And, and, and then just, um, I like to have people, I teach them like body scanning, right? Mm. Same thing. It's just stop during your day and is your face super tight? You know, are you clenching in your jaw? Are your shoulders drawn up? Or is your belly sucked in, right? We're all supposed to be small, so we all suck our bellies in. Um, and just stop gripping yeah. and, and release that. And I think those, those couple of things alone, whether it's pain, whether it's even leaking in your pelvic floor, because remember, we're talking about pressure. If we're constantly gripping and our body's not moving, it's not going to handle pressure well, and the one spot pressure is going to go stop through the bottom, which is going yeah. to end up with leaks. Right. So, yeah, definitely those things, and and just don't put yourself on the back burner. You know, it's not don't. Well, this isn't really that big of a deal. It's not that important. Um, at, at some point, it does. You know, it does become, and our body is always easier to fix or to to get it to work or to move better when we just start noticing that there's a problem. Not once we've lived in that problem for 10 or 15 years. Yep. So the last thing I always like to make my guest more human to the people yeah. that are listening. So I know I have a story of my two kids when they were born and delivered. You mentioned that you had a C-section. So just yeah. tell us a little about, about your experience with all of this. And I know you said you learned more as you started getting into it because of you being in the industry, yeah. but your personal experience, what was it like? Sure. So when I had my, when I had my first, um, my first son, I went into the hospital to be induced at just over 40 weeks. I want to say I was around 40 weeks and three or four days. Mm -hmm. So I was there for about 36 hours between like Cervidil, the cervical prep and Pitocin and nothing was happening. And I didn't know, I mean, I didn't know any of this stuff at the time, right? And so 
my OB came in and kind of gave me the option. Um, we can do a C-section now, or you can just come, you know, go home for the weekend and, you know, maybe labor will happen. And so me not knowing, I'm thinking, well, I mean, there's gotta be some reason I go into labor. So anyway, so I say, my husband and I talk about it and, you know, we're already here. Like maybe this is just a safer way. You know, maybe it just wasn't meant to like be a, a labor. So I have a C-section. Right. And then, uh, two years later, I have my next baby also a repeat C-section because my practice did not allow V-backs. Mm. So now I'm two C-sections deep, right? Now I have one more baby. So, <laughs> so he was of course a planned C-section. So I'm like, well, I'm two in already, but I would say, um, you know, I have my own struggles with my, my C-section scar was great after my first two. And then after this third one, I'm like, what is wrong with that? You know? So I have my own issues with it. It's just really restricted on one side and it kind of looks funny. And so, I mean, I deal with I the same body image stuff that I think a lot of us do. And, you know, and so I have like both sides of my brain. I have like the side that's like, Oh, that scar looks terrible. And the you know, lower belly looks terrible. And the other side that's like, you're being ridiculous. Like, give yourself some grace. Like it's three, like major abdominal surgeries, three babies later. Um, so that's, yeah, that's really my C-section story. And then with this being like, um, maternal mental health week, I mean, you know, postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety. So after my third, I had a, a struggle, which I didn't really identify as a struggle for probably like nine months after he was born. And then I was like, wow, these like racing thoughts that I can't get to stop. And you know, and it kind of hit me, this anxiety is not normal. So, right. you know, I finally asked for help from my, um, the OB that I was seeing at, or the GYN at the time. It's like, I don't think this is normal. Like I just don't feel right. I feel like I could fall apart anytime. Yeah. So, yeah. So would you in with, with women that have had C-sections, how, how do you advise them on if they want to do vaginal next time? It's, I'm sure it's a case by case per situation. Yeah, it, you know, um, I think they have to look at kind of what, what led up to their C-section, you know, how emergent was it, um, and, and really, that's, that's even a, that's a real place to talk to, talk to the obstetrician who did your C-section, right, because he, he or she is the one who saw all of those tissues, saw the uterine wall tissue, saw the repair, and, you know, they would that person would be the one to counsel as far as, is this a good idea or is it not? I think, you know, according to research anyway, barring any sort of complication during pregnancy, um, you know, VBACs can be really successful. And I think- More, more successful if they come see you, yeah. get their pelvic floor stable and They're, strong. Right there wouldn't be a problem. Or same thing, you know, seeing, seeing you as a body worker too, you know, um, for, for someone like me, I'm kind of thinking, you know, one, I could have waited long. You know, you always get like the, oh, I should have, could have, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But maybe, you know, with some body work for me, it would have been easier for my, my first son to, to come down and engage, mm -hmm. right? To kind of start labor. Maybe it was stuck high. I don't know. Um, but I, and I think so just having, take that time and give that time to your body when you are pregnant, right? Mm -hmm. So that you are set up for, you know, that baby can move around in, in the womb and it's, that he or she isn't getting stuck between behind um, like some tight tissues or whatever, um, because that's what we really need. We need that baby to be able to move because baby moving and, and engaging is kind of what starts that whole hormonal cascade. And then from there, you know, body kind of takes over. Yes. Yeah. So. Again, I think pushing home the point, if there's anything, <laughs> ask questions ask. and yeah. keep asking yeah. until you find some good answers and good, a good plan. Cause yeah. no matter what it is, no matter what trauma there may have been, no matter what surgery, no matter what happened in the past, if you have a plan, yeah. for the next thing, yep. your, your chance for being successful at that or having less pain or less recovery is so much greater. So is there anything else you would like to leave with everyone that's made it with us this far? You know, I, I think just, just what you said, know that there are all sorts of help out there and don't let anything like limit you. I, I had a few people that asked me, you know, what, um, what exercises should you avoid if you have had like a C-section or even a vertical incision? And, you know, it's, it's really, 
it's really doesn't kind of work like that. And mm -hmm. it's unfortunate that so many providers have made like these do and don't lists right. for different things, yeah. you know? So I think the question would be if like I had someone ask me, like I have a vertical incision and I have a lot of tightness around there when I do certain exercises. Well, that means that that scar tissue and that fact that you need some myofascial work and some scar tissue work, because you have restrictions there, right? So once that, once you clear that up and, mo and move that, that that should you do whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the same thing when it comes to diastasis, when it comes to pelvic organ prolapse. This is why you want to work with someone who knows kind of the whole gamut and can give you your options. That's informed consent. Yeah. You know, informed consent is. Here, here's what's going on in your body. Here's, you know, if we load it this way, it could do this or it could do that. Like in giving, giving the person in the body the option to make educated decisions for him or herself, right? Now, um, I know that obviously it'd always be better to be in person with this, but I'm pretty sure that there are a lot of people in cities and towns that don't have a pelvic floor specialist. Yeah. So could they still contact you, have some coaching, you know, yeah. virtually? Yeah. I think you'd still be able to help them that way, correct? Yeah. So um, my, my private business is called All Natural Female. And so I do virtual sessions. And I, of course, do in-person sessions, and I do both, like, from the physical therapy side, but also that pregnancy and postnatal fitness and return to fitness. Um, and certainly any kind of just, like, counseling and coaching and, and things like that. Yeah, definitely awesome. reach out. Yes. Just start. If you just, just make ask a question. question. Ask one question. Yeah. After you say the first words, the rest of it is easy. Right. So, so true. Yeah. So back to that physical, mental, emotional. I always like to do All that. All of them. What we do so often is this, you know, this is a major physical issue that we will deal with. Yeah. So if we, if we think we can separate that, that out from the, in, in the mental and emotional no. sides of us, we are very, very much mistaken. We can ignore it, but it will affect, yeah. if you're trying to, you know, um, be emotionally stronger, be at the top of your game in your craft or your, yeah. your, your job, whatever you're doing. If you're ignoring this physical side of yourself, they will all suffer because we can't do this. No, we are like this. And every parent hates this when kids <laughs> do it, but I love this visual because this is how we have to start understanding yeah. our bodies work is they yeah. are mixed together. So our physical, mental, and emotional aspects of this being have to all be addressed. Yeah. So this conversation, <clears throat> I think, could be life-changing for some people. Because if they're trying to make headway in the emotional yeah. side of their life and the mental side of their life, if this area is left undone, they can't get to the levels of the other areas yeah. that they wish they could. So thank you so much for joining us today with this conversation about the pelvic floor. I hope it's been something that helps people get more comfortable talking about it. And we will leave your information in the show notes and all your contact information will be there. So I hope to hear a lot of great things come out of this episode. Thanks so much for having me. Thank great. you. Till next time. See ya.